You're watching Power Nation. Today on Engine Power, we've got two words for you. Mopar Magnum. Hey everyone, welcome to Engine Power. You may have noticed lately we have been dragging a lot of things out of the mothballs, spiffing them up and running them on the dyno, which I think is pretty fun. And today is going to be no different, but it's gonna be all Mopar this time. This is a 360 Magnum. They came in full and mid-sized trucks and they are very popular in the hot rodding community and for good reason. They have a strong block, a decent flowing stock cylinder head and this 1994 vintage that we have even has a factory hydraulic roller cam. We thought it would be fun to get it up on the cart, make a few baseline runs before we start doing any mods. But as you've probably figured out, it needs a few more parts to get it running. So I have to go digging for some more stuff. Now we are going to do a full engine build on this Mopar, but we had an interesting thought when we were planning it out. Normally when you do incremental changes to upgrade your engine or give it a little hot roddy status, it means changing a camshaft or maybe adding some better valve train, doing an intake swap, or even adding new cylinder heads. But what would happen if you just added a stroker kit? And that is what we are going to do to our 5.9. We're going to roll it into the dyno, get some baseline numbers, and then pull it completely down and add 420 thousandths into stroke with a forged rotating assembly. And then add all the stock components back on. That means stock camshaft, stock cylinder heads, stock valve train, and the intake that we started with. And it'll be interesting to see how it affects power. Now this seems a little bit of backwards, but that's okay because we are going to upgrade the induction later and we'll have a solid foundation for when we do that. So once he gets those parts here, we'll get this sucker running and see what she makes. Start with this. Oh! Just kidding. I'll get more stuff. All right. These are a set of one and three quarter inch primary tube dyno headers we had in the shop. As I demonstrated, they are a two piece design that fits around the steering shaft of several vehicles. All right, I cleaned this stuff up. Heck yeah. I'm not sure if those are going to fit because. Um, the stock valve covers use 10 bolts, but these only have five. No worries though, because they fit and they seal up just fine. Even though the heads are cast iron, we'll put some anti-seize on these E3 spark plugs to protect the threads. Since we've got easy access to the crankcase with the intake manifold off, we'll pour some 10W30 synthetic oil into the lifter valley. After dropping on the intake gaskets, silicone gets applied to the china walls and the corners. The one thing we did not have in stock was the correct intake manifold. So we got this Edelbrock Performer RPM air gap from Summit Racing Equipment. It's a dual plane design that will pair nicely with our stock cylinder heads. We'll use a one inch dual plane spacer and top it off with an 800 CFM Edelbrock AVS2 carburetor. The next component we're gonna install on our engine is a locked out distributor. And that gives us a chance to talk about the types of distributors available. And we're gonna be using a couple examples we have here from Summit Racing Equipment. There's basically three ways that you can control ignition timing inside of the distributor. Vacuum advance, mechanical advance, or a locked out distributor. Vacuum advance has a vacuum solenoid mounted to it and has a rod that is connected directly to the magnetic pickup. When it sees more vacuum, the magnetic pickup will move and add advance into the engine. This was originally designed to make engines more efficient at low load operation like cruising. Another kind of advance is mechanical advance and that's directly related to engine RPM. Inside the distributor, there's a set of weights, springs, and bushings. The weights are constantly being forced out with centrifugal force and that is what actually makes the distributor add ignition timing. The springs are trying to hold it back and the bushings underneath these pins limit how much timing is actually added. Each of these components can be changed and that will affect the way the ignition curve looks and usually the instructions will come with a couple of different graphs to show you what each change does. Mechanical advance allows an engine to have less ignition timing at low RPM for things like hot starts and more ignition timing at higher RPM during normal operation. The last kind of distributor is a locked out distributor and normally you can either buy them that way or get kits to lock them out yourselves. This means that the rotor and the shaft 
move together. This is really common in racing applications where you don't want the ignition timing moving around at high RPM and you don't want it being a variable in engine performance. It's also used when an ECU is controlling the ignition timing because the ECU needs to see a certain value and then it will retard ignition timing from there. Hopefully this will give you a better understanding of how distributors work. For our engine, we chose a MSD Pro Billet locked out distributor. We usually prefer locked out timing on the dyno since it's one less variable to worry about and it makes the engine load in better. This is the best choice for our application, but if you need help choosing the best distributor for your engine, talk to the experts at Summit Racing Equipment. When we got the engine, it had a neutral balance harmonic damper. 360 Magnums are externally balanced on the front and rear, so we swapped it out for an OE style replacement. See what she does? Dialed in. These yeah. things only make 240s for... Yeah, stock. Stock, yeah. That's pretty decent right there. That wasn't there. bad. I think it's up from the stock. Oh yeah, I think, oh, I think so. a lot. 305.7 horsepower. And 414.8 at 3,400. Wow. That's nice. Had good oil pressure and everything worked great. Yeah, just have to get it off now. That was the easy part. Now we have to tear it apart. <laughs> Coming up, there's no replacement for displacement. Our Mopar gets stroked. All right, oil's already drained, oil filter is off, cut okay. it apart, look pretty good, so Very nice. start tearing her down. I'm impressed with how nice the exhaust ports looked. It's ran yeah. nice. Yeah, it did. I mean, it is a stock engine, but really smooth, so. Nice. Good. Yeah. Of course, to put in our stroker rotating assembly, we've got to tear everything down, so we'll get started. Got her? Got it. Just as you let go. Yeah, it slipped out. I Got the valve train tray so we can keep everything yep. in order. This is essential since we will be reusing all of the stock valve train. Our Magnum has a factory hydraulic roller cam setup, which we can reuse when we upgrade the camshaft later on. Stop moving the engine. Well, hold your side. <laughs> you didn't drain that side, remember? No, I don't remember. You, you but I guess we didn't drain the side, you, did you, we? You pulled the plug on that, this side. and on that Oh, because the header's in the cart block. And you side. said, I'll get that one later. Yeah. Well, Usually that's me that does that. I was wondering why you gave me this side. Now we know why. Oil pan studs make removing the oil pan a little easier, but the intense amount of silicone around the front of the pan definitely put up a fight. We had to cut it off with a knife, so we will not be reusing this seal. Even though it's new oil with only a few dyno pools on it, the fact that it's clean is a good sign. The slightly loose timing chain definitely indicates the block has been a line home. We measured and agreed the stock camshaft during teardown. At 50,000's lift, it has measured durations of 192 degrees on the intake and 198 degrees on the exhaust. Lobe lift is 284 thousandths on the intake and 279 thousandths on the exhaust. 
It has a lobe separation angle of 111 degrees, and the intake center line is at 115 degrees, which is four degrees retarded. Look at that gloriousness. Hey, it's almost brand new. Brandy new. Yeah. Now that we have our Magnum all apart, we can tell why it ran so well. This is a recent remanufactured engine. It has a 40 thousandths overbore, which looks really great. The bearings all look perfect, but they are a 20 under main and a 10 under rod. But that doesn't matter because we're not reusing any of those parts. We are going to keep them around, though, just in case we need any 360 Magnum stock components. What we're going to do next is get the block cleaned up as best we can, clean up the cylinder bores, and then we can get our stroker kit mocked up to make sure that the block doesn't need to be clearance. Sometimes we need to, sometimes we don't. Fingers crossed, but we're going to check. Then we'll get it fully installed and start putting our stock parts back on. How much more does our stroker make on the dyno? We'll find out. Before mock-up, we'll measure the vertical oil clearances. We'll install our new standard size main bearings and torque the caps to 110 pound-feet. Using our sun and dial board gauge, we confirm that all of the clearances are within spec. After installing some King narrow bearings we chose from Summit Racing Equipment, we'll repeat the process on the rods. On these SCAT connecting rods, the bolts are torqued to 64 pound-feet, following their specifications. The oil clearances check out fine, so we can drop in the SCAT 4-inch stroke forge crankshaft for mock-up. We'll put together the rod and piston assemblies, including the wrist pin locks, since the assemblies will not be coming apart after mock-up. Each piston is installed without the rings, and then we rotate the crank to make sure there's proper clearance between the rods and the block. We're looking for at least 60 thousandths of clearance. We finished mocking up our rotating assembly in our block and we didn't have to clearance anything, which is great. So we've moved on to final assembly. That means all of our components are completely clean and we've gone ahead and cleaned up the cylinder bores very well for our new piston rings. For that, we're gonna be using a set of total seal piston rings that are gas ported. So they have notches that allow gas to go behind the ring and help force out against the wall. They're a one millimeter, one millimeter, two millimeter pack to match our Molly pistons. And all we have to do now is get them gapped. So we're gonna gap the top one to 22 thousandths and the second ring to 22 thousandths for our application. After setting the ring into place with the Summit Racing Ring Squaring Tool, the gap is checked. We'll gap and thoroughly clean the rest of the rings and install them on the pistons. It's always important to make sure the rings are installed with the correct orientation, especially on specialty rings like our Napier second and gas ported top. Now the crank goes in for real with the ARP main bolts torqued in three steps to 110 pound feet. The piston assemblies are lubed, then gently tapped into the block. Just like before, all the rod bolts are torqued to 64 pound feet. We'll reuse the stock timing set since we used it when degreeing the cam before. Because we are using a new crankshaft, we'll degree the cam once more. It should not have moved, but you should always double check if you've changed any components. Our setup did advance the intake center line by one half degree. Now it is three and a half degrees retarded, which will still help our engine carry power a little higher in the RPM range. We'll measure piston deck height, which is four thousandths of an inch above the deck. We'll install the neutral balance harmonic balancer before tightening down the stock timing cover. So far, our stroker upgrade is going very, very well. Everything's gone together nicely, and we haven't had to clearance the block, which is awesome. There is one component we have to clearance, however, and that's the oil pump. We've gone ahead and upgraded our engine with ARP main bolts. These are gonna be much, much stronger than the stock ones, but it does add a teeny bit of work. ARP explains in their instructions that this main bolt does not have to have a washer, and that's to help give extra clearance. However, you may also have to clearance the oil pump housing itself, and we've gone ahead and done that here. You can see that we don't have to take much material off, just enough to clear the head of the bolt. 
If you don't do this, the oil pump housing will not sit flush on its mating surface, and if you try and torque it down, you could possibly crack the housing or break it. This is a great example of why it's always important to read the instructions first. It can keep you out of trouble and save you a lot of time and hassle. Once the oil pump and pickup assembly is torqued down, you can see we have enough clearance so the pump does not touch the head of the bolt. With silicone on the corners and parting lines, we'll drop on a new one-piece oil pan gasket and seal up the bottom end. We'll use a stock replacement Felpro head gasket, and with our stock cylinder heads, we now have a 10.73 to 1 compression ratio, up from 9.97 to 1 on the stock setup. The stock head bolts are torqued to 105 pound-feet. All of the stock valve train is reinstalled. The rockers are torqued to 25 pound-feet. The Edelbrock dual-plane intake manifold is gently set into place and then bolted down. Finally, we'll reinstall our carburetor setup, which is an 800 CFM Edelbrock AVS-2 and a 1-inch dual-plane spacer. Up next, it takes a Mopar man to understand a Mopar man. The time has come to finally see what our Stroker Magnum puts out on the dyno. All right, we've got our 410 running on the dyno. Obviously, Pat is not here. He's coming back, but he's at the machine shop getting some work done. So we have another big Mopar fan in the house, and that is Tommy Boschers from Detroit Muscle. Tommy, so basically what we've got going on here, this is a 360 Magnum, and we put a stroker kit in it, so now it's 410 cubic inches. Just added a good, about 420 thousandths worth of stroke, so a good amount of stroke. This is not normal. Normally you would do a cam upgrade or an intake upgrade or something like that, but this is kind of interesting because we don't get to do this a lot, and I think it's going to be cool to see how it affects power throughout the range. Can't wait to see what this thing makes. What, what do you think it's going to make? You know, or what do you hope for it to make? With a small cam in it, I know it's going to crank the torque up, but I'm hoping it makes more everywhere. I think that's the goal here is that it makes more throughout the RPM range. We're not turning it a bunch. We only turned it about 5,000 RPM last time. It peaked before that, so that's where we're going to turn it up to about 2 to 5. Sounds good. I'll show you the overlay because that made very good power. So 490.2 and 334 horsepower. Sounded killer, man. It just yeah. So that's the difference. Here. It sounds awful. Right there. I mean, you can see down low. It is just mm. pumping out considerable more. Yeah. That's, yeah. What was that at the peak there? 82 more at peak, and it, you can see it's just making more everywhere. And I think it's interesting that it did take the peak and move it down a few hundred RPM, which is. You know, when you're adding more cubic inches and then choking it off with a head and yeah. cam that's probably a little too small, that's kind of what you get. But you also get these really nice curves like that, just super smooth, you know. We wanted to remove the one inch dual plane spacer. Depending on the manifold, sometimes spacers improve performance and sometimes they don't. Let's find out. Removing the spacer had little effect on torque, which peaked at 490.8 pound-feet. Horsepower dropped slightly to 331.5. However, the air-fuel ratios evened out nicely from the left to right sides of the engine, so we're keeping it off. I really think you should ring it out one more time. Not necessarily for the numbers, <laughs> just to hear that thing sing. Well, and we do have a bigger carburetor. We did add 50 cubic inches, so and we do have a bigger carburetor we could put on. I mean, I just enjoy hearing the sound of it. I mean, whatever it takes, <laughs> brother. With the intake manifold vacuum rising to 1.6 inches of mercury during the pools, we decided to swap our 800 CFM carburetor for a 950. So for more. a little bit more there. No, 
numbers don't lie. Oh, yeah. About 10. 498.3 pound feet and 339 horsepower. Yeah. 331 horse earlier, wasn't it? Yeah. For torque, just picked it up everywhere. Horsepower really started to be noticeable around 3,000 where it picked up, but that's, that's almost 500 pound feet on a stock cylinder head, which yeah. is, to it's me, that's crazy, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be interesting to see what it comes up in, you know, like if you guys find a project for it or something, that'd be pretty cool. Well, that's the easy part, finding something to put it in. Hard part's getting it in. <laughs> that's right. It's yeah. the follow through is what'll kick your butt all the time. Yeah, but uh, that, I think that's cool. Like 498 pound feet, 339 horse. I mean, we're not turning a bunch and the cam's kind of mm -hmm. small, so horsepower is not, it's not a remarkable number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's yeah. up a ton from where we were. And you know, that, that big torque number, that's the one that always makes you feel like you're going fast. You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah, especially it, on the street down low a, like and that. And that's yeah. a respectable number, that low. That means it's going to get with it quick. That is, for, for a stock cylinder head on 410 inches, I mean, heck yeah, man. Well, if you find something to put it in, let us know, because... You got one this, laying around. We got one laying around. <laughs> we might do more to it. I'm not sure, but this is still, even as it sits, I think this is a really nice engine, so... But thanks for sitting in. I hate that you cut it off. It sounds so good just sitting yeah. there. I'll just yeah. let you sit here and let it run. Yeah, that's fine with me. As long as you let me play with the joystick over <laughs> yeah. there on the throttle. There you go. that would be it. For more information on anything you've seen today, go to PowerNationTV.com.